I've got all kinds of things floating around in my head this morning. And, you know, we've been doing a, a series uh, called Position for Provision. I kind of want to re-preach my message from Wednesday night. Uh, if you weren't here, you need to get that and listen to it from Wednesday night out of Acts chapter 3. But I am going to proceed this morning because I feel like that's what the Holy Spirit wants me to do in our, uh, in our uh, messages of position for provision. And this morning... I want to start out by just uh, bringing us up to speed just a little bit. Last week we talked, look, at, look up at the ceiling, see all the stars? We talked about the message of the gospel that God preached to Abram uh, before the law was ever given, before Jesus ever died on the cross. You know, we, uh, we, we talked about that God encouraged Abram with a... Uh, with a positive message. Whenever he did wrong, God encouraged him. Yeah. He not only said encouraging words to him, which I'm going to continue to talk about you know, over the next few weeks, but he gave him visual aid. The, the sand that he stepped on, uh, the stars in the sky, the land, circumcision, in which that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Look at somebody and say, I'm not too uncomfortable. <laughs> And <laughs> so Davey kind of opened it up for me to be a little funny this morning, so we'll see how that works. Um, but, uh, you know, God continually, I, I, I just want to, I, I want to get that into our heads this morning that God continually gave Abram uh, words and uh, visual aid to get him to believe that he was the righteousness of God in Christ. And that's where we're going to start in Genesis 15, 6. Uh, you know, Abraham, Abram had been through a lot of things and we come and we see that finally, you know, we, we talked about the stars last week and how that God showed him the stars in the heaven and said that your descendants will be like the stars in heaven if you can count them and that through, all, through you all the families of the earth will be blessed because we are blessed with believing Abraham. Abraham gave God the opportunity to get Jesus into the earth and that was God's most important thing is to get Jesus into the earth because that was the turning point for the human race for Jesus to die on that cross to take all of our sin all of our punishment be raised from the dead on the third day and now he lives on the inside of every one of us that has been born again or that has believed in what he has done for us but here we know that Abram was looking forward to the cross like we look back at the cross. In verse 6 it says, And Abram believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. And we know that, that here in verses 7 through the end of this chapter that, uh, that God literally had Abraham cut up the pieces of the sacrifice and God laid Abram on the side so that he could see and hear about the covenant that was being cut for him by God the Father and God the Son because a covenant is only as strong as its weakest link and a human could not be in on this blood covenant. It had to be the covenant of God that God was making for the human race incredibly important for us to understand that. So Abram was again on the ground in a deep sleep looking at what God the Father and God the Son was not only saying but what he was seeing them do reminding them of what was going to happen in the future at the cross. Look at somebody and say the cross was the turning point. And so uh, we come here and we see that Abram believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. This was really the first time that Abram believed. God had been giving him all kinds of signs. And God, even after this, Abram did not do everything right. Right. I mean, after this, and we're going to read out of chapter 16 today, after this, Abraham did some things that were wrong. Uh, but you know what? One thing that he did is that he believed that he was the righteousness of God in Christ. Right. Now, you and I aren't just accounted righteous. 
You are the righteousness of God in Christ. You have been born again. You have accepted Jesus into your heart. Abram was looking forward to the cross knowing that God was placing it on his account until Jesus died and did what he did. You say, Pastor Terry, why do you keep saying that? Because people need to know this. I would say that half the preachers in the land don't even understand this. Abram was accounted righteous. It was put on his account. But you and I have been born again. We have been given everything that pertains unto life and godliness. Once you embrace Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is now on the inside of you. And the whole Christian life is getting your soul wrapped around what Jesus did at the cross so that you can come into all the provision that God has given us in Christ Jesus. It's already done. God isn't going to go back to the cross. He's already done everything that needs to be done for you. But let me ask you a question. Are you tapping into all the provision that you know that you see as yours in the scriptures? Why do you need to come to church? So that you can hear and see things that will cause you to uh, be able to believe, trust, and have faith in everything that God did in Christ. See, I'm not here to beat you up in your physical life I am here to encourage you in what Jesus has already done and you say well how much do we need to hear this I think you need to hear it all the time God continually came to Abram God continually came to Abraham and preached the gospel to him not only in words but in visual representations so that everything that he heard and everything that he saw was all of God and what did Abram do he believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness if Abram did that then you and I now that we're on this side of the cross you and I should be hearing and seeing seen things that would totally convince us that we are the righteousness of God in Christ, that we are in right standing with God, that we are born again, that we are new creations, that we have the spirit of the living God on the inside of us, that we can do anything that we need to do in this life because now God lives on the inside of a tabernacle or a temple or a body that's, that, that he is no longer dwelling in a temple in Jerusalem. He lives in his people. Look at somebody and say, God lives in me. And see, it's easy for God to come and live in you. All you've got to do is accept it. That's right. Believe that it's yours. So I said all of that to, to get us, go back over to Romans chapter 4. And let me read some verses here. See how far we get this morning. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 4. And verse 1. It says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works by his flesh, by performance, he would have something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Now to him who works or has performance, the wages are not counted as grace, as unmerited favor, but as debt. Does anybody want to operate under works or debt before God? It wouldn't do you any good anyway. Hold your place right there and flip back to the previous chapter. And let's go back up to uh, verse 19 and let me read through the, through the end of the chapter just to give us a jest of where we're going here in chapter 4. It says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, everybody say, No flesh. No flesh. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, by your performance, no matter how good it is, will you ever be justified in God's sight? For by the law is the knowledge of the fact that we were all sinners in the first Adam. Look at somebody and say, I'm not in the first Adam. I'm not in the first Adam. 
I'm in the last Adam. His name is Jesus. He is the righteousness of God. I am in Him. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Who is that? Thank you. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ to just a few people who are really good. <laughs> to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation, a payment, by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, meaning everyone up till the time in the Old Testament uh, before Jesus died, you could be accounted righteous righteous even like Abram was if you look forward to the cross and you understood what was going on yes. Yes. so it's always been the same through his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed there's more that I could say about that but I won't to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus where is your boasting then it is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law or apart from your performance. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Look at somebody and say no. Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we then make void the law of God? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law of faith. Yes. Not the law of performance, right. but the law of faith, hearing and seeing something that would produce faith in us to believe that God is a good God. Romans 2.4 says earlier, it is the goodness of God that leads men to a place of repentance, of changing their mind about God and accepting everything that God has done for them. Then we come to Romans chapter 4 and Paul all the time uses Abram or Abraham as an example to us before the law was ever given and we've been talking about that. Abraham, according to Galatians chapter 3, was 430 years before the law was ever given. God never wanted to operate towards mankind in law. He did not want to operate in the Jews towards law. I could take time and expound on that. I won't this morning. You'll have to go back into the scriptures and look at that for yourself. I do not believe that God wanted to give the law. The Israel requested the law. God always wanted to operate by the faith of Abram by the faith of Abraham towards the human race not by our works, not by our effort and that's why Paul goes in immediately to, to say everything that he has said in the first three chapters of Romans he has concluded all of us under sin and all of us came from the first Adam and he said so here's how this is going to work how you're going to receive everything that God did for you is the same way that Abram received. It was by faith. It was by hearing and seeing a message. Well, how much do you have to hear and see? Abram heard and saw his entire life. The more he heard and the more he saw, the more he embraced the gospel for his life, it changed his thinking. Look at somebody and say, I need my thinking changed. Well, I just thought I went to church one time to receive Jesus. No, you need to understand everything that Jesus did for you so that you can live a good life here. That's right. That's right. So that you cannot be under condemnation. How many want to live under condemnation and fear and torment? No, I don't want to live like that. I want to live under the capacity in my own thinking to what Jesus did for me. I want to be able to receive everything that God has done for me in life. Now, 
I want you to look at verse 5 here in Romans chapter 4. It says, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies or makes the righteous ungodly. Was Abram a good guy, and was that why God went to Abram? Abram was a moon worshiper. He was a heathen. Now, again, I think he saw God in the stars. I think the stars themselves preached the gospel. But God came to a heathen man and said, here's what I'm going to do in you and through you for the entire planet. I want you to just stand back and watch me do it. But what I need you to do is I need you to believe. Look at somebody and say, only believe. believe. See, most of the church is so caught up with works and performance that we forgot that what brings our works and our performance to another level in this life is what? Thank you. Faith in Jesus and everything that he's done. And see, God hadn't left you alone. God lives on the inside of you. Look at somebody and say, God has not left me alone. Verse 5. But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, Abram, the first Jew, was an ungodly man and he became a Jew. Matter of fact, the New Testament in the, in the book of Romans, uh, it says that a true Jew is now under this new covenant, under this time of grace that will never end. I'm a lot more excited about that than you are. I said under this new covenant, this grace that will never end, yes. there's no ending of this. That's right. That's right. It's just going to keep getting better Praise and better God. and better and better. Praise God. Under this new covenant, under this time of grace that we are under, the Bible says that a true Jew is one who has been Help me out. Born again. Everybody say born again. again. Actually, it says in Romans that you've been circumcised in your heart. See, the Jews' big deal was the circumcision of a man. And we're going to talk about that. Hopefully, I make you laugh a little bit. Look at somebody and smile and say, I'm not uncomfortable. Look at verse 6. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from from works. Now, Paul used two illustrations, Abraham and David. Abraham was 430 years before the law. David was in the middle of the law. So he's saying to the Jews, it don't matter, boys. It don't matter if it was before the law, after the law. It's always operated the same way, by grace, through faith, in the cross, in the finished work of Jesus. Praise God. Now listen to this. Man, if, if the church would believe this, this would totally revolutionize our lives. Amen. Verse 7. Blessed. Look at somebody and say, I'm blessed. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. And under this new covenant, Jesus already took care of our sins. He's not, he wasn't imputing Abram's sins to him. He wasn't imputing David's sins to him. And he's for sure not imputing the sins of the world to them today. Read 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. Where was God at in the middle of all this? He was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself and not imputing man's sin to them. But Pastor Terry, how are we going to get people living right? We're going to get people living right by causing them to understand 
what Jesus did for them, accepting it, embracing it, renewing their mind to it, believing they have worth and they have value, and if you have worth and you have value, your life will change. The reason why people are doing the things that they're doing out there, the reason why the church, some people are doing some of the same things in the church as they're doing out there. Amen. Amen. Because we just don't believe that we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. My job to the world is to tell them that they can be made the righteousness of God in Christ. My job to the church is to tell you every week you're the righteousness of God in Christ. You have worth and you have value. It's on the inside of you. That's right. That's right. Look at somebody and say, I have worth and value. I have worth and value. Is that okay? Look at somebody and say, I'm completely forgiven of all of my sins. Past, present, and future. You say, Pastor Jay, God can't forgive future tense sin. He forgave yours before you were ever born. That's right. That's right. Jesus died 2,000 years ago for the sins that you hadn't committed yet because you weren't even here. God already forgave you in Christ. Now embrace it. Yes. I mean, the, all of Paul's epistles talk about the fact that we have received the forgiveness of sins. Hebrews chapter 10 says under this new covenant that God under this new covenant will remember your sins no more. So why would you bring them up to God if you're already forgiven? Well, you say, Pastor Terry, what would my God, what would my relationship with God be like if, if I didn't go to Him about not committing sin or do, sinning and then getting forget? What would my relationship with God be like? It might be a real intimate thing where God and you would just have relationship yeah. and you might begin to put a smile on your yeah. face. You, you might see things that you've been trying, to, habits you've been trying to break for years, they might just fall away without any effort or work on your own part because you're just having relationship with a good God. That's right. Praise God. That's pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? I think I could just stop right there. But I want to get into this circumcision thing. <laughs> yes, yes, the scalpel is not here. Sorry. <laughs> Verse 9. Does this blessedness... Then, now the Jews, whenever they heard Paul say this, they were going, whoa! Whoa, 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 wait just a second. You're saying that it's, it wasn't about Abraham doing works and it wasn't about David doing works, but it was about their belief in what they did. What about the law? What about circumcision? And so, man, this was, this was touching a place in them and it touches a place in the church today. And you say, well, Pastor Terry, we don't, you know, we, we're not, we know we're not under the law and we don't do the circumcision thing. Just hang on just a second. I'm going to make a statement with that. Verse 9. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abram for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Look at somebody and say, while he was uncircumcised. While he was uncircumcised. Stay with me. Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Oh, it said it right there. Wow, it's amazing if we just read the Bible. Sorry. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised. That kind of knocked out the Jews' deal on circumcision, didn't it? that he might be the father of all those who believe though they are uncircumcised that righteousness might be imputed to them also now i want you to now i want you to go over to verse 23 and i want to stick this in here i'm going to have there's a lot more explaining that i'm going to have to do in in future weeks out of romans chapter 4 but let me just read this verse 23 says now it was not written all of this stuff that we're reading it was not written for uh, abram's sake alone but that it was imputed to him for righteousness, but also for us. Look at somebody and say, for me. 
It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. What are you saying, Pastor Terry? I am saying that if we believe in what Abram believed in looking forward to the cross like he looked back at the cross, sin is not imputed to us righteousness is imputed to us literally to the point that we are born again. Look at somebody and say, I'm born again. You say, what does this mean to us? Oh, you guys, this is everything that Jesus wanted to do, everything that God the Father wanted to do to establish relationship with him once again where there's no barriers where your relationship with God, you can take the limits off. Do you know that, do you know in the last, I don't know, in the last 15 years at least, do you know that my relationship with God is not built around either me stopping sinning or asking forgiveness for sin or concentrating on sin? Do you know that whenever I go to God, I I do what Hebrews 4.16 says, come to the throne of God boldly in your time of need to ask for grace and mercy? Yes. Yes. Man, my my relationship with God revolves around grace and mercy, not about my failures. Come on. See, that's what was so awesome about Abram. He wasn't born again yet, but his relationship with God didn't revolve around all of his negative mistakes or it didn't revolve around all of his good stuff. It revolved around what Jesus was going to do. And so he always had relationship with God. If he was doing good, God encouraged him. If he was doing bad God encouraged him to come out yes. Yes. and receive life Praise God. and these Jews were saying man listen it is about circumcision look at somebody and say it, well, it wasn't now I want you to go back to Genesis and I know that I have a couple of mathematicians in here Donna um she is a lot smarter than I am at math, and she could probably figure this out uh, really good. Some algebraic equation that would blow us away. But I want us to go to Genesis chapter uh, 16, I believe it is, yes. And let me, let me just fill you in again on what happened in chapter 15. Abraham was... Abram believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. God, Abram cut up the, the sacrifices and spilled all the blood out there and God the Father and God the Son walked up and down those sacrifices while Abram was laying on the ground. He was seeing it. Look at somebody and say he began to get it. He didn't have it together yet because let's read chapter 16. It says, now Sarah, Abram's wife, because God had told him there's going to be a child born out of your house, out of your body, that is going to be the, help me out, the heir where the, the nations of the world would be blessed. Okay, you follow me? And then we come, and of course, Abram has it all together, right? Let's see what happens. This would get you thrown out of church right here. Not this church, but we would help you. We might help you a lot. Uh, Look at somebody and smile. Listen to this. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, See, now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. I do not believe that. Please go in to my maid because God said that there was going to be one born of Sarah. Hello? Yep. Yes. Not everything in the Bible is truth. Everything in the Bible is true. It really happened, but everything in the Bible is not true. Sometimes things are written for us so that we can see the negative things in people's lives so that we don't reduplicate what they did. See, now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Do I have anybody in here that wants a child, that you're believing for a child? Are you guys believing for a child? Amanda, stand up. (laughs) 
she's going to have a baby. You say, how do you know that? Because God's not restraining children from Christian and Amanda. Stretch your hands out. Father, I thank you right now in the name of Jesus for your power going into this situation and doing whatever needs to be done in Christian and Amanda's body so that they can produce a child. Father, I thank you that they relax. And Father, I thank you that stress for this is removed from them. Father, I thank you that they know that you're for them. And I thank you that Christian and Amanda are fertile soil this morning. I thank you that you're not holding it from them. Father, you are releasing it to them now. In the name of Jesus. Do I hear any agreement in here? Amen. Praise God. Amen. I'll expect to hear news before long. Amen. Praise God. Look at somebody and say, I expect to hear some good news. Listen to this. See now the Lord has restrained from me bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. Is she following God's line of thinking? Okay. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her handmaid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. Do you know any wife? No, don't answer that question. <laughs> My wife would not give me another woman. Nor would I receive another woman. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Listen to this. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. He should have been listening to God. How many of you know God can speak to you and somebody else speaks something and it's louder than what God's saying? Come on. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. Then Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her, her, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her, her husband, Abram, to be his wife after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarah said to, one, said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. Girl, you're the one that got me in this mess. Yeah. Hello. This was your idea, but he sure didn't say much about not doing it. Yeah. Oh boy, you guys. <laughs> then Sarah said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. <laughs> Boy, there's a lot that I could say right here. I'm just going to keep going because I want to get to the circumcision thing. <laughs> so Abram said to Sarah, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarah dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by the spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said to Hagar, Sarah's maid, Where have you come from? And where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. Nothing like an angry woman. Oh, that, I figured I'd have a, you know. You know, the Bible says that it's better to dwell in... A corner of a rooftop than in a house with a woman scorned. Yes. Not that my woman has ever been that. Right. <laughs> but we understand the scripture, right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Is everybody okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. She's trying to kill me, God. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. Even though there was a mistake made, God said, All I'm going to do in this situation is bless wow. Ishmael. Wow. That's right. Wow. Because God knew that it wasn't just about the Jews. It was about the Jews initially to get Jesus into the earth. But the truth was, God wanted the Jews to preach the gospel. They didn't do it. They crucified the, the Lord of glory. And, and, and instead of God just having a little circle with a bunch of Jews in it, God drew a big circle to include every human being on the face of the planet that would ever live. Yes. 
That was God's intent all along. Praise God. Wow. I'll multiply you exceedingly. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. Anybody think that's true? His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all of his brethren. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, I have also here seen him who sees me. Boy, there's a... Oh, I just got to keep going. Therefore the well was called Ber Laha Roy. Observe, observe it. Observe, it is between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. I need a mathematician here. Help me out. How old was Abram? 86. 86. How long does it take for a child to be in the mother's womb before he's born? Okay, so Abraham was 85 years old and three months. Okay, got it? Chapter 17, we're talking about circumcision. But Pastor Terry, we don't do circumcision. In the church, you know, that's, that's something that the Jews did. See, we, we, we have to understand the circumcision thing because we substitute our own performance or any act of holiness the church does for circumcision. We might not say circumcision, but you've got to read your Bible three days a week or you're going to hell. You've got to pray nine times in a day. You know, we have all of these rules and all of these laws that we tell people that God, God doesn't like you. God doesn't want to be with you. We, we don't do the circumcision thing. We just exchange circumcision. Get, it's, like, it's like getting in my Suzuki SX4. <laughs> but then I get out of that Suzuki SX4 and I get into a TL Acura. <laughs> I've, been, I've been seeing that on the back of cars TL on the back of the Acuras we get out of this thing of holiness and we jump into this other car it may look better but it's still the same as the act of circumcision well you got to come to church at least six times a week you got to tithe. You got to do all of these things. Now, should we do good things? Yes. Yes, we do good things out of a relationship yes. with God. It's a flow that comes out of us. We don't do it to get God on our side. They were saying that circumcision, man, if you don't get circumcised, you'll have no part of God. That's what they were saying. Well, what Paul is saying, Abraham wasn't circumcised whenever he believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Are, are you with me? Look at chapter 17 and verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, uh-oh, how far is it from 85 and 3 months to 99 years old. How many? 14. Almost 14 years, isn't it? Okay? Look at somebody and say 13 years, 9 months. 13 years, 9 months. All right. God appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. Let me make this point to you this morning. And some of you need to hear this. This is what the Spirit of God said to me last night. Some of you need to hear this. I have heard messages. I'm 52 years old. I've, I've been in the church all my life from a little boy. So you can't pull the wool over my eyes. And I've definitely taken the veil of Moses off my eyes. So you can't put that on my eyes either. Amen. From the time that Abram had Ishmael and the, until the time that chapter 17 and verse 1 was we call that the silent years. God didn't talk to Abram. 
I've heard numerous, over the years, I've heard numerous messages where they said, whenever you do something that's wrong, as bad as Abram did something that was wrong, God will close his mouth and not talk to you. That is not so, ladies and gentlemen. I will tell you that probably Abram was under a little bit of condemnation. You read the story. He loved Ishmael. He loved Hagar. He loved Sarah. He lo it was just a mess. Yeah. Have you ever been in the middle of a mess? Yes. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, come on. And so here is what the church has said as a whole. Here's what we do. You've messed up. I'm not going to talk to you. God's not going to talk to you. Why don't you just go get your life right, get it right, and then you can come back and join the rest of us who are on some kind of a power pride trip. Yeah, yeah thank you, brother. <laughs> God isn't being silent to you. Let, let me look at every one of you. God's talking. You and I might not be listening, but I believe that God wants to give you ears to hear. He wants to help you out of every situation, out of every problem. I think it took 13 years and 9 months for God to convince Abraham, listen, remember all the stuff I've showed you, the stars, the sand, the, the covenant, it's all good, dude. This is all on me. I'm going to do this. I think God was talking to him. I don't think it was the silent years. We just don't have all the intimate uh, revelation because in, in a couple of chapters later, God goes to Abram and calls him his friend. Yeah. Oh, this is powerful stuff. God is talking to you. Well, I think God is just allowing me to be in this situation. No, you've been convinced that you're supposed to be in this negative painful situation and as long as you believe that you will stay there but if you can get the cross happening in between your ears you're going to come out of your pain and out of your suffering because Jesus suffered for you so that you don't have to suffer but there has to be some repentance there has to be a mind change there has to be a, a mind shift praise God praise God look at somebody and say God is speaking God is speaking you know what I think? I think God's speaking to you this morning through me. Yes, yes, yes He is. Yeah. Praise God. Some, sometimes we're looking for a tornado. I can probably do that. <laughs> sometimes we're looking for a hurricane. Something, we're looking for something big to shake us and dramatic. But God wants to speak to you through a still small voice. Come on, Come on. He just wants to touch you and That's get you right. to believe what He's already done. And He gave us His Word for you to be able to do that. Praise God. Praise God. Glory to God. I'm almost to the circumcision thing. Everybody say He's almost done. <laughs> Listen to this. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and, shall be a, and you shall be a father of many nations. Did God change the initial here? Does God ever change? No. He's always the same. He came to Abram and said, This is what I'm wanting to do for you. He's just wanting Abram to get in on the deal. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. He says no longer here's, here's, here's covenant talk. He says no longer shall your name be called Abram but your name shall be Abraham. Everybody say Abraham. Abraham. Say it real fast. Abraham. I thank you. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you and I will establish my covenant between you, me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant. Who cut this everlasting eternal covenant? God the Father and God the Son. Hebrews says through two immutable forces it was impossible for God to lie. That's right. 
And also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. God again is preaching the gospel. God again is giving him a visual aid. Everybody say visual aid. Between me and you and your descendants after you, every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. Pastor, do we have to talk about this in church? Absolutely. There's a lot of things we need to talk about in church. Every male child among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you he who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised every male child in your generations he who is born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not your descendant he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant can I tell you just from us reading that right there just one little thought is that God said if there's a stranger in your house circumcise him and he'll get in on the covenant this is not an exclusive thing for the Jews only God's wanting to get all the nations of the earth blessed in this in what Jesus did. Are you following me? Yes. And Verse 14, And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh, if his foreskin that person shall be cut off from his people, he has broken my covenant. That God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name, and I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Everybody say yes. And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. See, he's still caught up in his mistake. Then God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him, and I will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. Then he finished talking with, uh, with him, and God went up from Abraham. So Abraham took Ishmael, his son, all who were born in his house, and all who were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very same day as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very same day Abraham was circumcised, his son Ishmael and all the men of his house born born in the house or bought with money from a foreigner were circumcised with him. Pastor Trey, what are you saying? This was 13 years and 9 months after Abraham, Abram believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. It was not through your effort. It was not through the law. It was not through your performance. It was only by belief in the finished work of Jesus. And you say, Pastor Terry, why are you saying this? Because we've got to get a hold of this. We've got to quit substituting other acts of holiness for circumcision and head right down the same road of death. Come on. That's a good one. Everybody say covenant talk. Go over to uh, Galatians chapter 5, and I'm almost done. Look at somebody and say, his plane's coming in for a landing. Now Paul is talking about the law and circumcision and different aspects of that which I did not have time to go into all of the aspects we're talking about, one little thing, circumcision. And he goes, actually in uh, chapter 4, 
he talks about the difference between Ishmael and Isaac. And he likens Isaac unto grace and Ishmael unto the law or a mixture of law and works, effort. Do you know what, do you know what Abram and Sarai's effort got them? And Ishmael. That's what Galatians chapter 4 says. Do you know what? Whenever they believe God, whenever they continue to believe God that they were the righteousness of God, guess what God did for them? Gave them a son. They got Isaac. Isaac is a type of grace. A type of uh, God's righteousness that comes as a free gift. And there's a lot of things that I could say about that. But in chapter 5 and verse 1 it says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty which, by which Christ has made us free. Everybody say, I'm free. Don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage of the law, your performance, circumcision, because all that's going to do is produce Ishmael's in your life. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that if you're going to do this, you've got to keep the whole law. The truth was nobody ever kept the law. Nobody still keeps the law. Jesus kept the law and gave his righteousness to us as a free gift. Verse 4, you have become estranged. Uh, Christ has become of no effect. You who attempt to be justified by the law, by circumcision, by your performance, you have fallen from grace. See, we, we say that people who fall from grace are people who sin. But if you go back up under the law or performance or circumcision, you have to do the whole law. You have to do it perfectly. Nobody has ever done that except for the Lord Jesus Christ. And whenever you go back up under the law and take yourself out from underneath Isaac, Grace, Abraham, whenever you take yourself out from underneath faith, Christ becomes of no effect to you in your life. Now verse 5, For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Here we go. For in Christ Jesus, it's not about circumcision, nor, about, nor is it about your uncircumcision. It's about neither one. It's about faith working through the love of God to receive what God did in Christ Jesus. It's not about circumcision or about uncircumcision. And Paul said here to the Galatians, you ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. It didn't come from God. It didn't come from Jesus. It didn't come from me. This isn't what I preach to you. A little bit of this law, a little bit of this performance stuff, a little bit of circumcision leavens the whole lump. But I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind. But he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision or any act of holiness, why do I suffer the persecution that I'm taking? Paul went through a lot of persecution because of his message of grace. Then it says the offense of the cross has ceased. And he says in verse 12, I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. You want to preach circumcision? You want to preach some other act of holiness? Paul says, take a knife and cut the whole thing off. Come on. Come on. You, you smile at me at least. You can't. Come on. Smile. This is serious stuff. Paul addresses it all through all through the New Testament. Paul said if they really think that circumcision or any act of, of, that they have was going to save them before God, then cut the thing off. If cutting a little bit of it off is good, then cut it all off. In Galatians chapter 2, you know what? Paul went to Jerusalem and the discussion was about circumcision. You know what the discussion led to? The discussion led to religious leaders sending people into the Johns. You read it in Galatians chapter 2 to spy out people's liberties. In other words, there was religious pastors and ministers looking under the stall to see if people were circumcised or not. That's how bad religion gets. And see, we're not talking about just circumcision cutting something off. I'm talking about any act of holiness. That's right. That's right. Anything that you think you do to come before God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. 
Nothing gets you before God. Do I want to take my liberty? The next verse, right after I read that verse, Verse 13, it says, so what am I going to take my liberty and just live however I want? Treat you however I want? No, there's a life in me that is keeping me. There's a life. Jesus is living in me. He wants to help me. Circumcision could never help me. The law could never help me. The sacrifices could never help me. But what helped me was receiving the Son of God who now lives on the inside of me. Praise God. Praise God. Even after Abram blew it royally and had an Ishmael, God was talking to him. God came on the scene and he said, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to change. Let, let's, go a little, let's go a little deeper. We've given you sand, stars, moon. We've given you, we've given you land. I've given you all kinds of, of uh, 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 reminders and admonishment. Let's change your name. That way every time you hear your name, you're, God's going to do this. That's what he heard. God's going to do this. Abraham, oh, God's going to do this. Praise God. Every, every time he went to the toilet, he was reminded of, of the covenant that God was making for him. And that's what circumcision was all about. It was a private thing. Yeah. Pastor, we're talking about it in church. That's because Paul wrote it down. Anything I find in there, I can preach. <laughs> Anything I find in here, I can admonish. I can, I can preach to you and talk to you about what, what this book says because this book is meant to give you life and it is meant to give you all the provisions of God that are in Christ Jesus. God did not pay for all of this stuff and then, exp- and, and then think, well, I want them to suffer. I want them to be in pain. I want negative things. To- God isn't like that. There's no variableness, no shadow of turning. But I'm telling you, religion runs deep. And religion has to be cut off of you, cut out of you. You say, I haven't got any religion in my life. (laughs) If you've been in the church like I have, there has been, listen, I, I think just about the time that I think that God's got everything, that I'm, that I'm right where I need to be, God shows me something else. God shows me another layer of who He is. That's why I coined the phrase, God is better than what you think He is. Because about the time I think I've got my thing all together, I see something else that God is better. God God is gooder. Look at somebody and say, God is gooder. God is good, isn't He? Pastor Terry, what is going to keep us in line? Do you think cutting off a part of a a person's body is going to keep you in line? The Bible says it's the love of God that constrains me. It's the love of God. It's the Spirit. There's a life that is in me that is restraining me. It's far better than the law or circumcision. God's living in me. He wants to have a relationship with me. If I can get my mind over on Him and everything that He's done in Jesus, He'll begin to draw me out of trials and tribulations and sorrows and problems. And you say, well, I just don't believe that. I'm here to convince you. We're going to talk about the fact that Abraham became fully persuaded. He began to cooperate with God. Took him a long time. You know what? It takes some of us a long time. Some of us. I've I've been in church. My parents are here. They took me from the time I was a little boy. And I'm glad they took me to church because I heard about Jesus. But the truth is, I had a lot of trash put in me that I've had to get past. I'm glad they took me to church because that's all we knew at the time. But I know more than that now. And that isn't putting me up on a pedestal. That's just saying I'm growing in God. There ought to be some maturity to people's lives, growing in the things of God, coming into a place of maturity. Do you think me putting laws on you and rules and all these things is going to bring you into maturity? No, it's going to make you dependent upon me. Me taking you out from underneath all that stuff is going to make you dependent on a God who loves you and cares about you. You don't need to be dependent on me. Now, can you depend upon me? Yes, you can depend on me. 
but I'm not your source. God just sent me here to throw a little bit of good stuff out at you. To be a voice. Why don't you stand up with me?